former social chair for Phi Delta Epsilon. And I want to welcome you all to the second annual William Gelfand Lecture. I'm really excited about tonight. The topic of this lecture is ethics in medicine hiding behind a white coat. And we have a very esteemed lecturer that has come to speak with us today. And having personally heard him speak before, I can tell you, you're in for a treat. But before I introduce him, we wanted to tell you a little bit more about this lecture and its significance to our fraternity, Phi Delta Epsilon. To help explain this a little bit, please welcome to the stage our current social chair, Pedro Diaz. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait, wait. The final Epsilon fraternity started educational lectures for its medical chapters shortly after it was founded by Aaron Brown in 1904. Each chapter has always been promised education by our foundation. Members made donations to the foundation so that its legacy could continue. When Dr. Aaron Brown passed away, this lecture was named after him. And finally, we have a few awards and lectures named of the members who have affected the most positive change in our organization. When we started pre medical chapters in 1994, the undergraduate chapters were being organized and the foundation wanted to ensure that they had educational resources. Because their lectures would not be as technical as medical lectures, the fraternity wanted to differentiate between the two types of lectures offered. Our pre medical lectures were going to be called foundation sponsored scientific lectures until the death of one of our youngest and most active partners, Dr. William Belfan, son of Dr. Dan Belfan of whom our outstanding pre-medical award is named after, died at the age of 35. William, known as Bill to his fathers, had been very involved with the fraternity during his medical school career, during his medical school career, and had been, and have been, sorry, and had been a uh, convention delegate and chapter president. Bill was always smiling, always glad to be with hope, and always there for our fraternity. Although he was a newly established physician, he was already active on the national level as a district governor, and was aligned to be a national president. When he passed away, our fraternity viewed this as a true tragedy. The fraternity officers knew that Dr. Gelfand would have remained active throughout his life and wanted his legacy to be honored by renaming our annual lecture after. And now to introduce our speaker, we go back to the doors. Thank you, Pedro. To promote the highest level of scientific and educational standards in the practice of medicine, that is our goal in the fraternity, and our speaker tonight exemplifies just that. On August 12, 2009, President Obama presented the, medal, the Presidential Medal of Freedom to 16 extraordinary individuals. Among these 16 were Senator Edward Kennedy, Supreme Court Justice O'Connor, Professor Stephen, Stephen Hawking, and tonight's keynote speaker, Dr. Pedro Greer. Dr. Greer completed his medical degree at the Pontifica Universidad Católica Madre y Maestra in the Dominican Republic. He completed his residency in internal medicine and his fellowship in hepatology and gastroenterology in the University of Man. During a residency training at our very own Jackson Memorial Hospital, he had a life-changing encounter with a patient who was suffering from a disseminating tuberculosis. When Dr. Greer realized that this patient was alone, homeless, and uninsured, without even being asked, he set out to find this patient's loved ones. His search led him to the Camilla's house, where he took the initiative to set up a small clinic. In this place, his passion for helping people was reinvigorated. He searched under bridges, abandoned buildings, really um, looking for the homeless, the alcoholics, the drug addicts, very, in very dangerous places. Um, I believe he was even held at gunpoint at once. But he never let that stop him. And he always encouraged them to come to the clinic for treatment. This is the man he is 
this type of man he is. After seeing all he did, others joined him too in his endeavors. And this little clinic turned into the Camilla's health concern. Ever since, he has not stopped fighting against injustice and poverty. He is always willing to help and always keeps an open door for anyone who knocks. Even someone like me, who might need help or advice. It is truly a pleasure and an honor to welcome to the stage Dr. Pedro Greer. Thank you, David. My mother wrote that. <laughs> I always do. Nobody told me about the dress code either. But not. <laughs> Makes me feel a lot more comfortable. My, my name is Pedro Jose Greer. I'm born and raised here in Miami. Grew up here, grew up in Cuba, grew up in the Bahamas, and live all around. Um, they call me Joe because if you grew up in the South, there's not a whole lot of rednecks that can pronounce Pedro, so you can eat. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting because uh, I, I played high school football at Columbus High, and it was the worst football team in the history of the world. We won one game in two years. But I, I, I got a ride to the University of Florida. Actually, the University of Miami was the first school to recruit me. It's sort of tough when you're recruited and you can show up on a bus. But at the time, the UN and FSU were the two worst teams in the state. This was late 60s, early 70s. And, um, and we used to call it the toilet bowl. That's how bad it game was. And when I went to play football at the University of Florida, it was the second year they had desegregated the Southeastern Conference. The dorms were segregated, the bars had white knight and black knight. And because my name was Pedro Greer, and Greer is a very common southern name, actually Greer comes from my great-great-grandfather who fought the Spanish-American War from Dalton, Georgia, Barnes Greer, ended up in the same that that Leo married a woman from the Canary Islands. Uh, they assumed naturally they had to be black. Greer, a very common uh, black name in the South. And so they put me in the black half of the dorms. And when I got there, my, my roommate, who happened to be the largest human being ever from the state of Georgia, <laughs> opened the door and looked down and, uh, and man, excuse me, but he said, shit, I thought you'd be black. <laughs> that was my introduction to college. It wasn't uh, like you had an orientation back then. Basically, uh, it was call us when you get there. And I looked at this guy, and one of his steps was five of mine. And I said, I, it's worse than you think. I said, I'm Cuban. I said, we look like them, but we dance like you. <laughs> <laughs> then there are my two most important lessons. If they're really big, become their friends. And if you look for what we have in common in this world, there isn't anything we can't accomplish. As a matter of fact, if you're willing not to take the credit for something, there isn't anything we can't accomplish. You asked me to speak about integrity. Integrity, what is the definition of integrity? Clearly, it's honesty, it's moral principles, it's moral uprightness. But I can be best described to me, by the way, a homeless man one time told me what integrity was. He said, Doc, you know what integrity is? I said, no, what is it? He goes, it's what you do when nobody's looking. And you have hiding behind the white coat. Well, I'm an academic physician. I was on faculty here at UN, I was an associate dean here. Actually, when I worked up in the White House, I'll tell you that story a little bit. But, um, we as a profession, we as academicians, have really screwed up. When we rank 36th in the world in health outcomes, there's no pride in that. When our children rank 37th out of the 38 most richest nations in the world in quality of life and survival, there's no pride in that. When if you live in the African-American suburban community of St. Louis versus the white suburban community of St. Louis, and there's a greater than three and a half decade difference in your survival, there's no pride in that. If you live in Little Havana, or Hialeah, or Overtown, or Oblaka, 
and you compare it to coral gables or pine crust, there's about a 20 year difference in survival. Do you realize that for the first time in the history of this country, your generation will not live as long as mine? You will, because you have an education. You have the social economic means. You can live with the things that are going on. You don't have to worry about police violence. You don't have to worry about gun violence. You have to worry about racism and sexism and ageism. And you have to, we have to overcome those things. But when that difference exists, and the same causes of Ferguson are the same causes that happened in Baltimore, that are the same things that happened in Flint, Michigan, you ask, where is our integrity as academicians? Where's the integrity as physicians? And it was a pediatrician that pointed it out after a public health worker pointed it out. You don't think other physicians have seen the same thing? Or maybe they live in that isolated world that we like to live in because we make so much money. That we don't see the whole world that we are charged to be responsible to take care of as physicians. Nobody applies to medical school and says, I don't want to take care of poor people. When you do your white coat ceremony, your first week of medical school, you'll take note. Two thirds of your tuition, it costs about 150 grand a year to educate a medical student, is paid for through public dollars. I mean, somebody paid a tax for it. And it might have been trying to buy food for a family when you live under the uh, federal poverty line. When you go on the wards and you learn, when I did my first endoscopy, when I did my first laparoscopy, when I did my first abdominal paracentesis, it was an uninsured indigent patient at Jackson Memorial Hospital. When you graduate from medical school, you take another oath. When did it become socially acceptable in our country to refuse a patient because they had no money? I'm sorry, let's go back to the definition of integrity. Moral uprightness. Honesty. Moral principle. The philosophical basis of what our profession is based upon. Humility should be in there. Service should be in there, because that's what we do. The responsibility that you carry as a physician, and let me tell you, our society reimburses us really, really well. Even if you go into primary care, and you're only making 200 grand a year, only 200 grand a year. Explain that to somebody who has a family of four and has to live below $24,000 a year. Ask them how they think. What do they feel about that? Oh, you worked hard to get into medical school. I don't think anybody's forced you. It was like my daughter and my son. We grew up, they grew up here in Coral Bay. When my daughter was applying to college, she wanted to know if she could apply as a minority. I said, really, what's your minority status? Have you been to private school your whole life? And I got the tuition bill, I wish you applied up to my <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> And uh, she went to Boston College, and she did a year with the Jesuit Volunteer Force. She had to live in San Francisco for an entire year working with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights on $8,000 to learn humility. There were six of them. They all crammed into this whatever kind of apartments that you had back there on the West Coast. And then she went to Harvard Law School. And then she graduated. Told me she got her dream job, job in public interest law working up in Washington, D.C. with the Advancement Project, which was about preventing schoolhouse to jailhouse. The state of Florida has more kids going from school to jail, more kids in kindergarten going to jail. I mean, what can you do as a kindergarten? When I asked my daughter, what was it that she actually did? She said, Dad, look at it this way. If you were in high school today, you'd be a federal person. <laughs> so she went around the country changing policies. And I asked her one time, I said, you know, you're smarter than hell. Took after my wife. You really want to help people. Why didn't you become a doctor? And she looks at me and she goes, I don't think you get it, Dad. Physicians are doctors for people. Attorneys should be physicians for the entire society. And, you know, I was thrilled because one of the things that my wife and I wanted to do since we had gone through college on loans or on scholarships was to make sure our kids didn't have to pay for anything. And of course, my kids were good enough to turn down scholarships and just pay for most as possible as they could. <laughs> and her dream job started off at $42,000 a year in Washington, D.C. And I said, look, Mom and I are going to buy you a car for graduation. 
She said, that I live in D.C. I don't need a car. I said, no, 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 I need to live in. Let's <laughs> see what you make. <laughs> so together, we work things. Because we, we're called health care providers. You know, you're not taught health. We don't teach health. We're not trained in health. We're trained in identifying pathophysiological issues called diseases. We're trained in how to intervene in diseases. So we wait down the river until you get sick. There's an old public uh, health analogy that if you're at the edge of the river and a body floats by, you resuscitate it. If 10 float by, you call your buddies because you're tired. If 1,000 float by, you build a clinic. If a million float by, you build Jackson. If two million float by, you pass a half penny sales tax and you expand Jackson. Somebody has to ask, why do they keep falling in the river? Why don't we just take a little walk up the river here and see what's going on? Why is that bridge broken? 80% of all diseases in the United States of America and in third world countries as high as 95% are caused by non-biologic factors. They're called the social determinants of health. The same things that caused Ferguson, the same thing that caused Baltimore, are the same things that make our patients sick. The diabetes, the complications from diabetes, the hypertensions, the cirrhosis of what I deal with, all of these are due to social determinants. Only about 7% are genetic. And by the way, we now know, and I was with uh, Brad Perkins, who is the uh, CMO of the Human Longevity uh, Incorporated Project, which is a, a, like a five billion dollar company that does, it's the biggest company in genomics. And they now realize that gen your genetics change because of social determinants. And because of social determinants, you have to recheck your genetics more than once in your life. It's called epigenetics. And so all of a sudden, these social factors that everybody thinks is soft science are the main causes of disease as well as the main cause of non-adherence with patients. And if we don't teach them, if we don't learn them, if we don't get off our high horse as doctors and think that, you know, we were placed here special, and start working together with our social scientists, it's never going to stop. And you're the one that has to go out and tell a 52-year-old mother with advanced breast disease that there's nothing you can do. Our students at FIU go to one area that's called Miami Garden. We superimpose national cancer data on there. We found out they had the highest rates of advanced breast cancer in women under the age of 55 in the state of Florida and second highest in the United States of America. 40% of the population we take care of there lives under the federal poverty level. You know what that is? That is probably half of your tuition to support a family of four. It's 24300 some odd dollars a year for a family of four. That's what the state of Florida thinks makes you poor. Anything above that, you don't get any assistance. We also don't have Medicaid expansion. And by the way, all Medicaid has to be with managed care. So what happens? When you go into these communities, vulnerable communities that have survived in ways that I don't know how they can, they need to teach us their survival. When we ask the women, why, why don't you get the mammograms in public health? They said, seriously, darling. If both husband and wife are working or it's just a single parent household, and you're making 24 grand a year, and we got this great public transportation in Florida, and you want to get to public health, and you got three kids, and you got no daycare in your community, you got to pay four bus tickets and probably switch two or three buses to get to public health, wait, be treated not very nicely, get your screening mammogram, and then if they have a result that's positive, they ask you to come back in because you got nothing better to do than lose another 20% of your weekly income. Because we're doctors. Come on, we have a medical thing here. you got to make your way to live to our lifestyle. Because we haven't changed the way we deliver health care in 100 years. And you know how long it takes an uninsured or a Medicaid patient to get a mammogram injection? If she needs a diagnostic mammogram. Nine months to a year. So don't you think you have a lesion that could possibly be malignant, waiting nine months to a year? Could be a problem. And then it takes at least six weeks minimum, sometimes up to two months, three months, to get an oncologist or a surgeon. 
And that's why they looked at us and they said, Doc, why should I go get a mammogram? I'm going to die anyway. What kind of integrity lies within our profession when we allow an individual within our own community with that? My kids grew up in a bubble. We call it coral gables. And you need to make sure that if you want to be a physician, it's just not for folks that get to drive nice cars and live in nice homes. Medicine is to be taken and to be done without prejudice. Not prejudiced to those that have, and not prejudiced to those that don't. Not prejudiced because moral principle doesn't mean you push your religion on somebody else. Moral principles and moral rightness means that you respect other people. Something that we're supposed to be doing in learning professionalism is our profession. Because we're supposed to be the example for the rest of this country. Because apparently politicians aren't doing that. At least not the current Republican candidates. <laughs> so, you carry a burden on your shoulders. And it's just not to save lives. It's to improve what is known as a new definition of health. It's called the culture of health. And you'll learn that when you get to med school. That was started by Robert Wood Johnson and Kellogg and all the big foundations. And you're going to learn that the culture of health goes far beyond the size of a tumor or just reducing the hypertension. And you learn this because we learned that we deal with consequences. When I was working with the homeless, I dealt with consequences. One of my first patients who had a horrible fungal and bacterial infection of the people, which by the way, I was taught in medical school that rarely happens. Apparently they weren't walking around under bridges. And one of the things I told the patient was, okay, I can get you the antibiotics, you gotta keep your feet dry, because how can I keep them dry? So just, you know, at night, at least when you're going to sleep, don't put, you know, just no socks on your shoes. And he looked at me and said, have you seen the size of the rats in Miami by the river? I've got to wear shoes. Early in my career as an intern, I learned that a patient had to choose what they were gonna suffer from, not how I could help them. There's something inherently wrong in this country that's happened. We're not a third world country, but we have statistics that far exceed third world countries, and they're horrible. And I take no pride in that, but I do take pride in the fact that together we can make that difference. Look at the fact. We teach you evidence-based medicine. Then read the damn evidence. And look at it and deal with it. Because you can make a difference. It's your generation that's going to have to roll up its sleeves and realize that academia sits on three legs. Education, research, and clinical. And they should all be together with education. But the stool itself is the social mission of medicine. And please don't interpret social as something political. <coughs> it's a society we call it social. That's what it is. And if you want to put another word after social that's even more important, it's called justice. Justice doesn't mean equality. Justice means what's fair for everybody. If somebody is five foot two and another one is six foot four and I give them equal benches to stand on, the six foot four guy can still see over the fence. Five foot two can't, it's equal. Surely not just. So we have to adapt what we do to the realities of other people. That means that we are forced upon as physicians to have what I call cultural humility. Not cultural competency. Nobody can learn everybody's culture. But you can be culturally humble. You can sit there and listen and learn. Because you're taking care of somebody, not for the physical disease itself, in the culture of health, it's their quality of life, it's their beliefs. It's the things you need to respect. I've had the advantage of, I'm like the Forrest Gump of medicine. Things just sort of happen. Early in my career, I worked in the uh, Bush Senior Administration. I'm a Democrat, and I will work with whoever it is to improve my nation. I worked under Lou Sullivan. Then I worked on the transition team with Clinton and on the health reform. And I approach life because I don't belong there. I'm a kid from Westchester, which is now called Westchester. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's advancing to Westchester by DC. We live on a canal. And so I remember the very first time I, I uh, went in to meet uh, Clinton. 
I was at the time an associate dean of the University of Washington, so we were out there uh, as academicians uh, advising the president. And so we were invited into his office and went in there. The other deans that went with me were uh, someone from Hopkins. You can always tell Hopkins faculty because they congratulate each other. The Harvard faculty would introduce themselves as God, not the God, but one of the many gods from the, uh, the Boston area. And back in those days, back in the uh, early 90s, when you worked in the White House, we, you generally the work we did was in the old executive office building, which exactly contiguous with the White House. So I had a white badge with a black A. That meant I needed an escort. A blue badge meant I needed, I needed no escort. This was way before 9 11, obviously. And um, so we get into his office, and everybody's introducing themselves. And it's my turn, and I said, Hi, you know, I'm, I'm uh, Pedro Jose Greer, I'm associated here to Miami. School of Medicine, I said, I'm one of four Cuban Democrats. We meet on a phone booth on 8th Street. <laughs> that was pretty funny. <laughs> Nobody laughed. <laughs> so I held up my back. I said, we don't really must think about this. We got into Watergate without these. <laughs> the Cubans broke the war. <laughs> but I always remember what uh, George Bernard Shaw said. If you're going to tell people the truth, make them laugh. Because if not, they might kill you. <laughs> so I always try to use humor. Do you remember the, the what? What was the first year the United States actually measured disparities in public? 1985. We didn't have an office of minority health or an office of disparities until 1986. That's far behind the curve we were. When the opportunity came up to start a new medical school here in South Florida. This was now in 2007, I got a call from John Rock, who was the dean, I was about the fourth hire. And I had become very frustrated because education became the least important thing for almost all medical schools. It's how much money we make clinically, it's how much money we can do in research, what can we publish, this and that. You know, we're not gonna take care of outside our walls, but let's see what we can do. Our social contribution to the world is our scientific discovery. Because we just discovered the genetic reason why you have gray hair, which they did in London. I think that's really pertinent. <laughs> it's not going to help me any, but you know, <laughs> that's great. Let's spend more time on hair restoration and erectile dysfunction in our studies instead of looking at things that are actually going to improve the health and the life of individuals. I believe very strongly that we as academic institutions, that promotion should not be based on how much you publish that the impact your publication has. Was it a contribution to improve the lives of others? That's what science is. And NIH shouldn't be granting money to academic institutions until we can prove the improved health outcomes of our communities, since we're being given public dollars. We have that responsibility. It is not somebody else's. So at FIU, we started a school in the middle of a recession. We weren't going to open a hospital. We didn't need a clinical practice. A big, we're not going to compete with Baptist or UM. So we decided to say, let's start the very first new curriculum in this country in 99 years. Because the following year after our inaugural class was the 100th anniversary of the uh, Fletner Report. Fletner was hired by Hopkins with a grant from Carnegie Mellon in 1909 to make a difference in American medical education. Up until the late 1800s, Doctors did not wear white coats, doctors wore black coats. The nurses wore black coats, but most of them were black in uniform, but most of them because they were nuns. Doctors wore black coats because it was pretty much quackery. It wasn't because it was a solemn event or something respectful like a man of the cloth, a rabbi, or a priest. It was more the last step before death. Then Lister came and Osler, and the importance of the biosciences and flight. And the report was written in 1911. Rockefeller gave him $90 million in 1911 to go start medical schools that were two years basic sciences, two years clinical. So Flagler saw, as did the rest of medicine at the time, the importance of biosciences in improving the life. And all of a sudden, from the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, people's health began to improve. Then we began to see the disparities. Those that could afford it, got it. Those that couldn't, didn't. And then about 10, 15 years ago, there's enough studies to show that doctors should not wear white coats. 
They are just the most wonderful petri dishes that exist. We should actually wear short sleeves, scrub tops, and wash and clean before you go in and see a patient. But the white coat symbolized like the Greeks and the togas, something virtuous. But if 15 years ago we realized the coat wasn't the right one, just like the black coat, we forgot that there was a new science that we weren't paying attention to, the social sciences, the causes of disease. Academic centers are not well liked in poor neighborhoods. You go in with a lot of baggage. You walk in. For decades before that, universities get grants, we do studies, but when the grant runs out, we leave, and they stay. And when I was proposing to John the curriculum we needed, one of the conditions was, and of which he not only full largely supported, he expected it, was that whatever community we as a medical school go into, we stay in perfect community. Our main mission is to educate physicians for the future of this country and the world. But we're a state school and our mission is also to produce physicians for our state. We rank 48th and 49th out of 50 states that ranks in the low 30s compared to the rest of the world. So things aren't that good down here in Florida. They're definitely not that good in Dade County. A lot of work needs to be done. But it's a challenge that if you can do it here, we can do it anywhere in this country. And when I hired, my first two hires, my first was a Hispanic female, my second was an African-American male, both PhD, not MDs, social scientist. And I, finally I said, I need a white Jewish guy from New York or else they're going to accuse me of no diversity. <laughs> so I did. But Lou Brewster, the head of our division of uh, policy, research, and community development, did his postdoc in London with Sarah Curtis doing uh, uh, community participatory research and community development, worked in the private world with our faculty at the University of Michigan, and uh, we recruited him down here. When I presented my what I wanted to do and how I wanted to have very different interpersonal teams, interdisciplinary teams. I worked on teams in the hospital with the doctor, the nurse, the pharmacist. That's wonderful when you're in the hospital. And we went beyond patient-centered care. We do what's called household-centered care, because I believe the household becomes the most important unit of measure in the cause and the prevention of disease, not the workplace. It's food insecurities. You don't have enough money to buy the diet. It's financial insecurities. It's the stress. It's living in a community with gun violence. It's living in a community with police brutality. It's living in a community that doesn't have transportation. It's a diabetic that sits on his porch in August in Florida after it's rained because they can't afford air conditioning Mosquitoes bite his legs, he scratches, it gets infected, he ends up with an osteomyelitis, and we amputate the leg. All he needed was a fan and screens that didn't have holes in it. And when you knock on people's house doors and you ask them what they need, nobody ever says a colonoscopy. Nobody says, I need a mammography. I need a job. I have foreclosure issues. All these other things going on. And what do we do as academicians? We read our surveys, we come back and we say, don't worry, we're going to build you a clinic. They go, oh, we never mentioned a clinic. Integrity, honesty, aren't we supposed to listen? Aren't we supposed to take care of our patients in that way? So our teams consist of medical students, nursing students, this year we're adding PA students, but we have law students, we have social work students. We have graduate public health students who are adding biomedical engineering because I want their perspective and also how we can make this even better. And we have students from the School of Education. Why would we have students from the School of Education as a team that goes out? Why? Because the students that are responsible for these households, they're responsible for these households for three and a half years. So they learn interdisciplinary teamwork. They learn longitudinal care. They learn population health. But they learn the realities of what it is to be a physician. For too long in medical education, we've prepared you for the perfect world. Headline, there is no perfect world. What we're supposed to prepare you to do is to be the critical thinkers of the future. 
the ones that can look at the world the way it is and make it healthier. That's our job. And you know what? No matter how much debt you graduate from medical school, Latin American Express invitation will come in the mail. <laughs> Somebody's sure you're going to make some cash somewhere down the line. So it carries a responsibility with it. And that responsibility is the title you have, it's integrity. It's moral principles. It's asking questions like, when did it become socially acceptable to refuse a patient because they had no money? Not just that we do it. Nobody seems upset about it. And the reality is, the more you do this, the more you learn, the more you learn from patients, the more you learn from what's going on out there. Sure, I'm over. Get upset. Don't ever give a cube in the water, we'll talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it's what we can learn to improve people's lives. We teach the social determinants of health. We have now consulted in about 25 different schools, outside schools, we have permanente schools, and two new schools in Texas. But I'm also consulting over George Washington. Kind of called and wanted to see how they can change their curriculum. The problem with medical schools is we say we want primary care, but the neurosurgeon still gets the big office. We know there's huge changes coming to the American Association of Academic Hospital Centers. The biggest push in the last three years has been get, trying to get academic health centers to understand social determinants of health. So that, because if not, they're going to close down the schools, or the hospitals. Because Medicare is not going to pay for a readmission within 30 days. And when you discharge a diabetic, you have a diabetic diet, and they can't afford the diet, or they can't read, guess what? Diabetes will go out of control, and they'll come back. Our internal medicine res uh, clerkship that we have at Jackson Memorial Hospital we have the hospitals and the ACC. What we do now is when our student identifies a patient that could be part of this household care, the team comes in and evaluates the patient. When that patient is discharged and goes to the home, say they were in Jackson for hypertension out of control. I can send a PA or I can send a medical student team out there to check the blood pressure. You know what? That patient doesn't have to take three buses in August, sweating, to show up at the clinic. And let me tell you, when it's hot, your blood pressure goes up. So what do we do? We prescribe more medicines. That makes a lot of sense. Or the diabetic that you discharge, to go home and look at their cabinets, bring the nutritionist. What can we do with whatever limits you have to make you eat healthy? And if it's a family of four and they can only afford one diet, imagine if we got the entire family eating healthy. And when it, we have 160 partners in the communities we work in, they refer the households to us. When the teacher calls from the elementary school and says, Johnny hasn't been in class for a week, and we go to visit Johnny's house, and the reason he's not in class is because there's a chronically ill person at their house, which has happened in various times. Perhaps they have dementia, which is right now more expensive than cancer care and cardiovascular care in this country. It costs over $91,000 a year to care for a person with dementia. Do you really think in the neighborhoods we're at they can afford $91,000 a year? And one of our household members that came in and talked to our students talked about when her father got dementia. She had a college education. She was now 65. But she wasn't making enough to pay $91,000 a year after taxes to take care of her father. So she had to retire and move in with her dad. Because the part of Opelaka they live in was so bad, she was so scared she bought a gun to protect herself and her father. Now, the state of Florida has a wonderful law. It's called Doc versus Law. By law, I am not allowed to ask a patient if they own a handgun. A pediatrician isn't allowed to ask that. The number one cause of death with guns are handguns. But guess what? The law doesn't say a medical student can't ask a patient. And if they answer yes and it's a legal handgun, we send one of our safety officers from FIU who goes and trains the family in gun safety, and then we pay for the lock for the gun. And when this woman told the story of what we were doing, she says, oh, it's wonderful getting the medical care. But for the first time in three years, I have had my grandchildren come and visit me and my father because I wasn't afraid of the gun laying around. I think we improved her quality of life and her quality, her culture of health. 
Because even if we had her blood pressure under control, life's no fun when you can't see your own family. And you're afraid to protect somebody else. Because those are the realities we live in. So we have to listen. Each one of you are gifted. Each one of you will be leaders. And you know you're going to be leaders because you're at UM, like my kids, you're going to the schools for the financially gifted. <laughs> you're going to become doctors. Those that want it bad enough. And don't ever fall back and say, I worked so hard to get here. Remember who you owe. You owe those that taught you to be a doctor, not the faculty, but the patients. And if you listen carefully, they'll teach you more than any Nobel Prize laureate could ever teach you. I'm going to read you two stories, which I read quite often, because they were two stories that impacted me. And I'll end there. You've heard you're going to have to listen again, okay? It was a Tuesday night at the clinic when a young woman in a tattered red dress came in. She was about 25 years old, but she seemed a lot older. This is the old woman. The lines of her battle weary face barely concealed beneath the smudge of stale makeup. Her soiled clothes, a swath of spandex. They told the story of her hard life on the streets. Her eyes revealed her turmoil. Whatever her story, at the very least, she deserved. That night I was working with some UM medical students, third and fourth year, and I sent Carl as a third year student in the room too, where she sat weeping. Within minutes, Carl came running out. Dr. Greer, he called me in a hurry tone. Can't get a history, I don't know what to do. I said, what is it, Carl? I don't know, she's crying like a baby, I can't get her to talk to me. I said, what's your guess? Physical, emotional, drugs, psychological. Insisting give him the signal to follow me. He opens up the chart. So she's been here one time, no psych problems. <coughs> Came in for some nerve condition. Does smoke crack, he said, with a little smirk. Must be the person of prostitution. I stepped into the exam room and found a desperate woman. She was trembling. I extended my hand to greet her. If you become a physician, you touch another human being. That's something that has to be taken with the utmost respect. If you're ever on a rotation on the ward, some attending says, Listen to the heart. Please don't put more than one stethoscope on the patient at a time. Respect that person. Don't talk about all the differential diagnosis in front of a patient when you don't have the correct diagnosis yet. It's just a differential, really. Because when you mention certain words, it's not going to be raised in their mind, like cancer or heart failure. Be careful. It's about integrity. It's about honesty. It's about moral principles. We're here to help you. You heard somewhere I asked, gently nudging her elbow to give her a sense of stability. She was full of tears, gasping for air. It's her sound here, she said between sobs, holding her lower abdomen and dibbling over. It feels like it's burning, it won't stop. Please help me, please. The nurse and I laid her down on the exam table and I continued my physical exam with the patient. I concluded that her symptoms in the physical exam suggested a mix of both pelvic inflammatory disease and other sexually transmitted diseases. It'll be okay, I told her. I'm trying to offer her a little reassurance. Slowly she began to tell us why she had really come to the clinic to have gone to the United College the public health unit. I was raped. Raped hard last night, she said, as she doubled over again in tears and in shame. Why didn't she go to the rape treatment center at Jackson? I asked. It was just a couple miles away at this top-notch center. Doctor, she said, with a little bit of suggestion, I should know the answer to my own question. Look at me, she said. Look how I'm dressed. And then she then broke into sobs. I couldn't take the comments people would make. A human being is violated on our streets. We're so big about judging. This is such a blame city. Seriously, folks? person is violated, and because of the way we look at people, or comments we might make, can't enjoy the resources that are supposed to be for everybody because of these invisible things that we put up. And she was right. <coughs> you see, she taught me more than anybody else. This man the system of health care could offer excellent medical care and all the best technology. 
but buildings, technologies, they offer no solace, no empathy, no protection from prejudice. That's because there's something you cannot construct. That's called a soul. And that's your job. Because you're all going to be leader, and how you lead and the decisions you make are it's going to make the difference, not only in the division you're in, in the department you're in, the system you run, but most importantly, the lives of those that we have sworn to take care of. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Back in the late 80s, when HIV was hitting, we started the clinic in 83, whether it was crack, where the other Great Depression great recession was during the Reagan years, those weren't such good years, folks. I'm telling you right now. Overtown looked like a war zone. Look at the picture from the Bronx from the 1980s. They looked like London during World War II. Yeah, but well, we used to call her cracker. She taught me more than the PhDs and MDs that were teaching. Because it wasn't about her disease. It was about the fact that she could get no solace, no empathy, no sympathy because of the system we had created. That's when I say we've done it wrong and we need to fix it. And I, I'm going to end up with this one story here because this one really. Something that has really impacted me. It was a Tuesday night at the clinic. Not Tuesday night, the wrong one. <laughs> one afternoon around lunchtime, I walked into the clinic with a sandwich. I greeted the patients in the waiting room and walked over to the pediatric area where I found a mother with three of her children. They told me they had come into the Salvation Army and that their youngest child caught my eyes. He was six years old, a little boy with a sweet smile. I offered him my bag of lunch, which he graciously accepted. He took the sandwich out of the bag. I don't need the sandwich. I'm a non perfect boy. And I'm Catholic, so I feel guilty. <laughs> Took it out of the wrapper, took a couple bites, and he wrapped it back up, put the sandwich back in the bag, and he stuck it in his coat. Why'd you do that, I asked him. My goodness, I've worked in two presidential administrations. I've traveled the world. I have three postdoctoral fellowships. I'm a little homeless kid. What the hell do you want? For God's sakes. He comes to a clinic that's Camila's health concern. Where everybody knows that you only go there if you're the poorest of the poor. Not a great little label that I blame myself for. You know, one year we asked homeless kids what they wanted for Christmas. And you know what they told us? Socks and underwear. Nobody donates socks and underwear. When you study philosophy, Socrates will teach you to question assumptions. You must question the assumptions that go from beyond. To understand what cultural humility, and in the case of this child, it was a cultural poverty. The reality of those lives. Now, if you're going to donate socks and underwear, buy new ones. And when I looked at the kid and said, Why'd you do that? His reply stunned me. The little kid looked up at me nonchalantly and said, It's for my brother. You see, he was hungry, but he knew how hungry his brothers were. To treat without prejudice, not to judge, except in a medical decision. That's what's expected of our profession. And when it doesn't happen, you should get mad. Because we are there with the sanctity of life to care for others. God has allowed me to study medicine, to explore the depths of disease and his treatment. He's given me those brilliant professors and inspiring mentors. Has opened the tombs of healing and placed in my hands the most precise instruments of modern technology. And on any random afternoon, I have been offered the most remarkable postgraduate courses. I've been allowed to find them in the gentle lull of the city of Miami under a bridge in an emergency room in the waiting room of the neighborhood clinic. In the wisdom and humanity. Every morning I wake up, and what I hope for that day and what I pray for that day is I can be that six-year-old child. That I can go every single day without judging. That I can go every single day with as much humility as possible. I was just talking to David. I never walk into a surgical case without being nervous as hell. 
You don't show it. You're like a dog on the water. You look really fun. You'll appear going a mile a minute. Why is that? Because there's a human life on the table. And if I'm not cautious and I make a mistake, somebody loses a family member. When you tell a family member that, when you tell a patient that they have a malignancy, and somebody is next to them, a friend, a spouse, a child, boyfriend or girlfriend, the second they hear that diagnosis, that other person is going to get raving mad at you. Not at you, but at the message. Because they just learned they're going to lose somebody. And you're going to have to walk them through it. Every one of my patients, funded and unfunded, get my cell phone number just like I give it out to all the students. Don't text me, I'm too old. <laughs> Don't email me that, that. And if you CC on the email, forget it. I don't care you guys spend so much time on that crap. The, uh, actually, I tell my faculty, if you send me an email, call me and let me know. Because I'll change the heart, I'll, I'll miss it. Or if you call me, maybe we can resolve the problem right there and there. There's a lot of nice things about human interaction, I'm going to tell you. But with that, what I want to let you all know is that you guys are at a wonderful time in the history of medicine in this country. You're at a time when we want to make effective change for the right reason for the reason of making our, our country healthier. And we need to know our limitations as physicians, but we also need to know that since we've been the power players this whole time, we need to lead. Do you ever wonder if the University of Michigan or Michigan State had done something in Flint? What if SLU or Washington University had done something in St. Louis? How about Hopkins in Baltimore? Imagine the power of those universities that they have truly invested in improving the health of their communities. What a difference we have in this world today. And you get to have that opportunity. You get the opportunity to save the world. My generation, we were going to save the world. Everybody got stoned, they forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're old. And we're going to pass it to the you guys, it's been an honor to be invited to speak here. I know I ramble on a little more than I should have, and I apologize. But I'm very passionate about my profession. And I believe that each and every one of you has the heart, the intellect, the desire, and obviously the suits and ties. <laughs> get to that interview, except for you. <laughs> <laughs> that you can make this world better. Thank you very much. So you would think that everybody in my profession, or my, especially a GI, 
since we know that, would have supported expanded Medicaid or Affordable Care Act. The majority of African Americans in this country live in the South or Southeast. We did not. We didn't even do Medicaid expansion. You'd think we'd do the colonoscopy for free. You know how long it takes to do a colonoscopy? Seriously? 15 minutes. What are you going to do if you're not doing that? Eat donuts? That's healthy. <laughs> and there's fixed costs. So, I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a washer. For 15 minutes, the nurse is still working for that hour. All you're paying for is the cleaning of the equipment, the IV, and the tubing. And if you do a biopsy, you're reading the biopsy. And so you think we do that. When my American College of Gastroenterology published that about 11 years ago, we had our ethical flaw. We presented it at the American College of Gastroenterology meetings. We published it in the GI journals. You would think of a population that has a 25% higher mortality from a specific illness, you'd make a bigger ba uh, bang, bigger noise. But we didn't. We didn't tell the primary care doctors. We didn't push for the change in the national guidelines just within ours. And we didn't go to the New York Times so the rest of the country could know. In Dade County, African-American males have the highest rates of metastatic prostate cancer. Did you know that? So we, should we use the same guidelines for the rest of the country? So we need to develop new guidelines. That's how we need to work together with public health. The, uh, the other thing is, too, that we've developed, we've been working with the RAND Corporation. I chair the RAND Corporation's graduate school for PhD in policy analysis. On developing methods or, or new methodologies of obtaining data because the, the one thing that we commonly do in medicine are surveys. Anybody here ever taken a survey? I hate surveys. <laughs> Everybody hates surveys. So why do you think that if you're going into a poor neighborhood where they're working six jobs, you aren't going to hate it ten times as much as we do? So we have to be smart, thoughtful, and mindful of what we're doing to be able to obtain the right data so we can turn that around. That's why we need to work with public health, because that's what they're training. Why do we work with the legal services? Because when we first got there, they told us that their issues were legal. Foreclosure, deportation, immigration. It's not easy to live when you have those pressures on your shoulder. It's not just about the disease. And so the future has to work. As to whether or not, it depends on our profession of medicine. We've got to get off our high horse and realize that the other professionals know just as much as we do in their respective disciplines. Our outreach team in the neighborhoods we're in, we hire high school graduates, not college graduates, because college graduates get a job. Of the 20 high school graduates we've uh, hired over the last 10 years, 18 have gotten their undergraduate degree. Why? Because they can get it for free now. They work at the university. Three are going for their master's and one just left to get a PhD. Amazing amount of talent that sits in these communities. Because they're not only living in this community, with the same factors I was talking to you about, but they're now working and going to school. Not like my kids. Okay? My son studied theology and philosophy out of California, so he's a bartender, but he's doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> he's actually a, uh, an actor and improvisational comic. He tells me that comedy is the lost passion <coughs> of political incorrectness to make a good social point. <coughs> so, the, the, the idea is the responsibility that comes with you and realizing our place and, and treating others with respect, treating others as equals. I wouldn't be where I am today unless I went through all the schooling that I went through. So obviously I'm not that damn smart. Because there's people that make it 10 times better than I do without ever having to go to school. So working with public health is essential. Working with all the other disciplines are essential. So, and thank you for bringing that up, but it's important. We just got to get the culture of academia to change. We're too silent. We're so silent that what I've done, since I chaired medicine and family medicine and all these things, we actually, at one time I had to play the politics, so our original name was the Department of Humanities, Health, and Society. I didn't want medicine anywhere. I have, a, now I have, when we're back to our name, I have the Department of Humanities, Health, and Society, and I have five divisions the Division of Medicine, which has all the specialties underneath it. Division of Family Medicine, that has also its specialties, geriatrics, sports medicine, things like that. I have uh, the Division of, of Policy, Research, and Community Development. That's with Lou and the Social Sciences. And we've just developed a, a program with this uh, graduate school of RAND and policy changes. Because policy analysis, you need to understand, it's not just about changing policy and government. 
is changing the policy of how do I ask if you have a gun. It's no, we can no longer sit back and say it's somebody else's fault. Be smart enough to figure it out. Get in trouble. If you don't get in trouble, you're not trying hard enough. That's the way it works. You gotta break some rules when you know they're wrong. You're gonna have to forgive this. It works out. And it's, and it's fun to do that. Because you guys are in that point right now in history when it's needed. Don't lose that opportunity. Because at the end of your career, well, it doesn't matter how many cars you had or how big your house is. The damn kids leave anyways. <laughs> you know? Or any of that. You're going to sit at the end of your career and you're going to say, did I make a difference? Did I make this world better? Did I make my country better? I don't want to be ranked so I don't have to competitiveness to be the best. Well, the best isn't just having the best techniques in liver training. But the best is being able to prevent them because they didn't get the illness. And so, you know, I don't know. You guys can make a difference. I'm sort of counting on you guys. Your hair is my color. And you probably won't because I'm going to do that reason. I want this to be a better world. And I want you guys to make it that way. So, I wish you all the best of luck. I wish you Godspeed. Study your ass off. Don't be so damn competitive as undergraduates. Working together is not such a bad thing. And go out and make the world better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. for a really eye-opening speech. Um, at this time, I want to thank everyone who to make this lecture possible. I want to start with the previous and the current keyboard, especially Sarah Madrid and Ethan O'Malley for helping facilitate this. I want to thank Cooper March, our PR chair, for helping with the flyers and the advertisement. I want to thank our new social chair, Pedro Diaz, for helping prepare with the food, the Facebook group, and a lot of the last minute work. I want to thank the entire William Delphin committee for all your hard work. There's 12 of us, so I'm not going to say the whole, the whole list. <laughs> and I especially want to thank you guys for coming. Um, this would not be possible without you and your, your presence here today. And finally, I want to thank Dr. Greer for agreeing to speak to us. Um, uh, I'm speechless when it comes to describing how wonderful this was today. With that being said, in the name of Phi Delta Epsilon, I want to present to you this plaque to show our gratitude for helping to promote the highest level of scientific and educational standards in the practice of medicine. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, this is the end of our presentation. Um, there's still some refreshments and I think there's a, a lot of sandwiches left. Um, if you guys want to stay and hang out, that's fine too. Um, we'd love to hear from you guys and thank you very much for coming.